like somebody just dropped a huge bomb. And I mean, there was nothing left. It was just complete chaos and screaming, a lot of screaming. I was uh, in Mayfield at first light outside that candle factory where I, I thought we lost 100 people. We couldn't find more than that. There are a lot of people who've been affected by this that they're still going through the effects of that. We're on the road to recovery. One day they're, they're going to be back. And you know, when they be back, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. It's going to be, I believe in my heart, stronger. From the WHAS 11 drone, the overhead view one year later, the small town of Mayfield, Kentucky, forever changed after a tornado outbreak left a trail of destruction across the western part of the state. And the iconic Graves County Courthouse, built back in 1888, now torn down, an American flag flying in its place. In other parts of downtown, windows are still boarded up and piles of debris remain everywhere. A sign of what happened here late into the night on December 10th, 2021. Thank you for joining us for a WHAS 11 news special, Kentucky tornadoes one year later. I'm Shay McAllister. And I'm Doug Prophet. The tornado that hit right here in Mayfield, Kentucky was on the ground for 165 miles. Also devastating the towns of Dawson Springs and Bremen, Kentucky. Separate tornadoes hit Bowling Green, rural Taylor County, and other communities all across Kentucky. The warnings though had been coming in for more than a week, but experts say nothing could prepare them for what was to come. First responders have said this community just could not handle the wrath of this storm. Through 911 calls, firsthand accounts, videos before, during and after the storm, we take you back to the night of December 10. Nine one one, where is your emergency? Um, yes, ma'am. I don't know who to call, but we're in a trailer park, and I'm babysitting my grandkids. Ma and we don't I, 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 listen to me. I don't know what to tell you to do. You need to get to a safe location now. It got really quiet outside, really quiet, and then the power went off. You could feel this gust of wind, and the building swayed, and then it just dropped. Nine one one, where is your emergency? Listen, listen, listen to me, listen to me, we are getting people on the way. It was just complete chaos and screaming, a lot of screaming. Hey, listen, everybody's, everybody's been here and we're going to get help out there as soon as we can, okay? Stop breathing to death. Okay, I know. There it was, I just saw it, we just got the trail. We were warned for days, weeks. And I don't think you ever, you don't ever think it's, it's gonna hit. And for it to be that powerful, you just, you don't think it's gonna hit you. We couldn't have prepared for the eventuality that struck Mayfield. At the Mayfield Candle Factory, more than 100 workers were feared missing crushed beneath heavy machinery and steel beams. Kiana Parsons Perez turned to Facebook Live for help after she says 911 dispatchers told her there was nothing they could do. Because in my mind, it hadn't even dawned on me that the whole town had been hit. I was just thinking about us. You have to delegate on who needs it the most. It's a hard decision. Within an hour, thousands of first responders from across the region were heading to Mayfield, making their way through the chaos, trying to get to the candle factory. We feared we had a mass casualty event. Paramedics and firefighters, uh, volunteers, I mean, it was all, all hands on deck there. All hands on deck, including the hands that had been there on work release. Inmates from the Graves County Detention Center later called heroes after pulling people from the rubble. They could have walked off or left or whatever, and um, you know he and others didn't. They they did what they should have done. They they stayed stayed there or, or you know reported back to the jail um, to say you know hey we've done all we can do. On December 11th, the sun rose, revealing devastation beyond belief. 
Cranes carried large pieces of debris from one spot to another. The methodical rescue mission focused on finding any sign of life. I had to climb up to get out because once the rescuers did come, they told me that they couldn't move the air conditioning unit because there were about five feet of debris on top of it. So eventually, um, the way they got us all out was we had to climb up all that debris, climb across beams and debris that had um, shifted that was stationary. The desperate search lasted for four days until every person was accounted for, those who survived and those who didn't. Father, thank you for who he is and what he's done. A Graves County deputy jailer among the dead. Father, I want to pray right now for this family, Lord. There were funerals that I was unable to attend because mentally I couldn't. One year later, all that's left of the Mayfield Candle Factory is the concrete foundation. No sign of the chaos, no sign of the tragedy from December 10th. It's almost as if it never was. And, you know, that wasn't a dream. That wasn't a, a nightmare. It was a part of my life. And part of this town's history that will never be forgotten. In the days after the tornado, there was another plea that we heard often. That's right, Shay. Residents, community leaders, elected officials all said, don't forget us after the headlines fade. So had they been forgotten one year later? And how often has the governor been to this part of Western Kentucky since last December 10th? I asked him in a one-on-one -on -one interview in Bowling Green. Hi, Governor hey, Shea, Doug Prophet, good yes. to see you. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir met us for our interview on this Bowling Green Street, now full of new homes. His 41st visit to Western Kentucky since last December 10th, and the second time in two weeks that he'd been to this very street. 10 Habitat for Humanity houses are nearly ready for tornado victims and first time homeowners in Bowling Green. Uh, we have $16 million invested thus far. Uh, in 300 homes. Its progress is hard to believe, considering how it all started in the evening hours, December 10th, 2021. Tell me about the moment of the, of the night or whatever it was when you learned that this was going to be as bad as it was. So I got a call, I had, think I was just going to sleep, saying that uh, the tornado had hit Mayfield, larger than anyone could have anticipated. Uh, the damage was gonna be severe and they did not know how long it would be on the ground. We knew that we'd have bad weather. There was no way we'd know there was an F4 tornado that was gonna hit and be on the ground for 200 miles. It's just the trauma pours into you. Um, wanting to, to help, seeing the destruction, feeling people's grief, both from loss and in that moment, the, the despair about what do we do? At one news conference. I know like the folks in, in Western Kentucky. Um, the stress and despair. I'm not doing so well today. And I'm not sure how many of us uh, are. Took over. I was working on getting the confirmed deaths this morning and realized I was writing on the back of, uh, of notes that one of my kids took from uh, school. In the overnight hours, as the tornado was clearing out of the state, the governor headed to the flattened Mayfield Candle Factory first, arriving just as the sun was rising, thinking at the time 100 people had died. And when you saw there were, there were eight backhoes trying to pull wreckage cars off what was the roof, uh, we were praying for, for a miracle, and, and, and we got one. In the end, there were 13 dead at the factory. What's the one image or something maybe someone did or said to you that uh, still sticks out to you now one year later? Walking through uh, downtown uh, Mayfield and being able to turn 360 degrees and nothing is standing, nothing. But now, one year later, the disasters have left us lessons and blueprints of how to respond. Does that first hour information turn out to be accurate or end up being worse than, than what you've been told in the first hour? Who? Um, typically, you have an idea of how hard it's hitting when it starts, but you don't know how long it's going to last. And so you know where to start deploying your resources. And then there were his very public comments critical of FEMA not acting fast enough. How many times did you have to intervene and get, and get in fights with FEMA to try to? Dozens. That much? It, 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 it's everything from, I raised it in every call with the president and with the vice president, and, and we would see some changes uh, after that. Do they lack all compassion too? No, did you they, see that? They have the compassion. They just have a lot of restraints 
and they have done things. They, they were still operating in many ways for the disasters of the past that were smaller, that weren't wiping people out uh, entirely. To help the state get around the slowness of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the governor launched the Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund. Since the disaster was making world news, the money started rolling in by the second and started going out quickly to one thing. First, we paid for every funeral because the process otherwise you have to go through is, is reimbursement a year later. These families are grieving and nobody should have to cut corners. Whose idea was that? It was mine. And it was the least we can do is, is, is grieve together. But with so many homes being built, how safe are they for the next tornado? The Habitat homes, we noticed, have crawl spaces under the home, but no full basements. We are building storm shelters um, uh, close to um, all of these uh, new constructions. We will have different areas um, that people will know about where they can go when something's going to hit. The demand for housing here was strong before the tornado. While we will have rebuilt, oh, I think we'll be close to 100 new homes in year one. We got several hundred more to go, at least uh, after that. And during year two, next year, the governor will also be running for re-election. Western Kentucky, hit so hard, is also solidly Republican. When I'm, when I'm here, I'm thinking a lot more about my faith uh, than any party registration. In the end, if the decisions we make, you know, uh, run me out of town, um, I know we've done the right thing here, and, and, you know, I can be good with that. As these new homes come to life, the governor says there will always be a lasting image for him. Sort of in your mind about the people of Kentucky. What have you learned about them? What have you seen that uh, has brought you to this point as the disaster governor? You've seen yeah. so many responses. Well, we Kentuckians are not only strong, we are amazing people. We open our hearts and our homes to one another. All the stuff that people typically argue about flies out the window and we will do anything. For one another. With the governor's return here to Mayfield on this December 10th, he will be nearing 45 visits since the tornado. And of course, next year is an election year. You can expect many more visits from Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir to this area. Within hours of the December 10th tornadoes, thousands of FEMA workers, Red Cross volunteers, and Good Samaritans descended on Western Kentucky. And then it would take months for these communities to realize what recovery really looks like and what it would take to rebuild these towns torn apart. But one year later, community leaders, both those in official positions and those who emerged through the tragedy, tell us they are on the road to recovery and they plan to build back even better than they were before. In downtown Mayfield, this is what the road to recovery looks like. Debris removed, destroyed buildings brought down. It's a foundation ready for the future. The courthouse has been, been cleared off. Many of those buildings have been cleared away. It looks really clean and ready for, for new growth. Uh, you still see a few things like bent uh, lampposts and, and if, you know, weeds coming up here and there. Um, and they're, they're a little further down on the priority list right now because we have 190 families still homeless. Al Chandler is a local pastor, a father to seven, and chair of the long-term recovery group for Mayfield and Graves County. So about mid-January, close to February, uh, there's a lot of good going on, a lot of organizations, local, state, national, even international groups coming in to help us. We started realizing um, that there were some things starting to, to fall through the cracks, some people starting to fall through the crack. The help was there, but unorganized, he said, something that is common after disaster. The solution, a long-term recovery group, advised by national volunteer agencies like the American Red Cross, but led by neighbors. It's been really awesome to watch those groups stand up across Kentucky because we had so many impacted counties. So it's been really awe-inspiring to see local citizens, teachers, bankers, stay-at-home moms, pastors uh, come together and create these long-term recovery groups. Some people call it an airplane that you're building while it's flying, um, and that makes perfect sense. The group works in teams, organizing volunteers, donations, finances, construction, health services, and most importantly, case management. 20 case managers are now working through what was once 4,000 FEMA claims, 4,000 families begging for help. These survivors are tagged or matched with a disaster case manager and begin to walk them through. What do they need? 
You know, what, what, what did FEMA give them? What did Red Cross give them? Uh, what else do they need? You know, what, this church helped them with this. You know, this organization, Rotary, helped with this, you know. So begin to coordinate that together. Part of that process has been understanding the roles of FEMA and others. Chandler says those groups aren't designed to get families to the finish line. That's not their role. We quickly figured that out. Uh, I think their role is definitely, hey, here's what happens in disaster. Here's a direction you need to go and we'll help you on your way and go, you know. Um, that's different than we're going to completely take care of every one of your needs. He says that job is up to them and it starts in this warehouse. So we were able to get this around uh, April, March or April. A former factory now turned to disaster recovery hub. Case management happens in the office and in the back. A lot of donated materials that can come in and we're using these on, on repairs and rebuilds. The beginnings um, of the future. So let's go take a look. Ah. Inside everything from mattresses to sheetrock, tools and cleaning supplies, all of it donations. So many organizations that uh, we can barely keep track of them. That's a good problem to have. Yeah, huh? it is. Still, this community has a long way to go with 190 families still labeled homeless. They deserve to be home. They deserve to have peace. How long do you think it'll take to get these communities back to a place where they're saying, this is it, this is where we want to be? Crossing the finish line is, um, you know, I, I don't know, Shay, that I could put a number on it, but I know that a year later, we've made big strides in getting some people home. Um, you know, if I said a year, if I said two years, I don't know because there's so much need. Uh, there were so many homes lost, so many people displaced. Um, it's beyond me to be able to put a number on that. In this community, you can't put a number on disaster recovery. You celebrate the success seen in new build homes, work through the slowdowns, so many repairs still needed, and lean into the possibilities the cleared lots ready for their future. It's our job to, to come alongside our neighbors and to restore them and to recover them back to where they need to be, back into a home and hopefully even better than where they were before the tornado. And nobody knows about the process of rebuilding better than the mayor of Mayfield herself, Kathy Onan, joining us now. Mayor, first of all, you've just done an incredible job over this last year. I've been watching it every few months as we come down here to do a story and you can see the progress. Where do you see the most progress? I see the very most progress in people who really had no other reason of being here except for the goodness of their hearts. And that is with the nonprofits who are here building homes for our people who have lost theirs. Samaritan's Purse is probably the most well known of those. And they are currently building a subdivision for us right on the edge of town. Pretty incredible. Well, it's when amazing. you look around, you see the progress. You can also see there's still a lot of work to be done. Where is your priority list? What is the thing that you think most needs to happen? I think housing is always going to be our first priority. We're at the stage now, both the city and the county lost all of our government buildings. So we're real wrapped up in that right now. But once we get that on the ground, then we'll be back to housing for our people. And of course, rebuilding the people who are here, rebuilding their businesses and their offices. Mayor, you told me that people actually sent personal checks to the city of Mayfield. They would arrive directly here. What were they telling you on how to spend that money? What was it for? Give me some examples you heard. Probably the very first of the end of the two weeks, the city, the department heads sat down and we started opening envelopes. And in those envelopes were checks made out to the city of Mayfield. Now that amount grew to only about $150,000, but we were very careful in how we spent those with, because they came with specific instructions. One of my favorite ones was from a lady and she said, it was a check for $50. She said, I want you to buy those policemen some ice cream. And that's exactly what happened with that money. There was a check from a church, a Baptist church, I think in Ohio, that wanted to go to destroyed churches. So we had two Baptist churches who had been completely destroyed. We called that church and asked, would it be fine to split that money? which we did. One check came to help a youth organization and so the Boy Scouts had lost their trailer. We called the organization that sent the check and then they, that went to the Boy Scouts. You were one of the first voices I heard say and within the days of the recovery when it beginning, don't forget us. Please don't forget us when the headlines pass away. Have you been forgotten? 
No. Uh, by government officials or the rest of the world, what has it been like in the past year? We have not been forgotten. It is still amazing to me what comes into the into Mayfield in gifts and t mostly time now, which is amazing. There are still groups coming from all over the southeastern United States and, and even as far out west to help rebuild. And they will help through our long-term recovery group to be assigned to places to help rebuild. Mayor Kathy Onan, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank you. Best of luck in the future. Thank you so much. The storms of December 10th actually came as no surprise. They had actually been predicted days in advance. At WHAS 11 that night, I was on the air all night long and into the early morning hours with Chief Meteorologist Ben Pine as he tracked that line of tornadoes actually moving south of Louisville. Now Ben reflects on that night and what we've learned to better prepare since that historic night of tornadoes. Anytime a ferocious tornado hits a home, it's shocking and can be surprising. As meteorologists, what we strive for most is fewer surprises and much more preparation. I remember very well in the days leading up to the December 10th tornado outbreak, the advertising and anticipation of a possible severe weather outbreak, especially for areas just to our west. Two days before, on December 8th, the Storm Prediction Center, which is a division of the National Weather Service, had a level 2 out of 5 severe risk for our region for December 10th. On December 9th, that was upgraded to an enhanced level 3 out of 5, and by December 10th, the severe weather outlook was raised to a rare level 4 out of 5 moderate risk. This is uh, now in south central Breckenridge County is where you need to be seeking shelter at this time. While our WHS 11 viewing area was not in the middle of the severe weather risk bullseye, we still had our entire first alert storm team tracking and chasing. Even though the strongest tornadoes did stay to our west and south, we were on the air for 10 hours straight through the overnight and into Saturday morning, December 11th, tracking several tornado touchdowns. Recently, I spoke with John Gordon, the meteorologist in charge at our local National Weather Service, who was also preparing his team for that busy night. Oh, we went crazy that week with promoting this to our partners, media, emergency managers, and tried to tell them this is going to be really bad Friday night. After these historic and tragic tornado outbreaks like April 3rd, 1974 and March 2nd, 2012, we try to take something away from it to learn from and be better prepared for next time. The tornadoes at night. Yeah. I don't care if it's in the spring or in December, which is bizarrely rare, right? Yeah. So in the middle of the night, you've got to have ways to receive warnings. You have to. That's mm -hmm. the takeaway. So not if, but when the next tornado outbreak occurs, the WHS 11 First Alert Storm Team will be ready and here to help you prepare. While much of the attention following the December tornado outbreak focused on western Kentucky, parts of the city of Bowling Green were also devastated when an EF3 tornado touched down there. 17 people died in Bowling Green, including seven members of the same family. So Shane, when I returned to Bowling Green, I found people there even rattled now by normal thunderstorms. But a housing boom is underway and they got a big assist from a lot of people in Louisville. It's home from school, a site that says things are normal on a sunny afternoon, but is it? Homes in this neighborhood are still boarded up. One year later, a sign is still on this front door. Everyone that lives here is okay. We will come back as we can. Vacant lots with just foundations remaining. Normal on Moss Creek Avenue in Bowling Green, they can only wish. Here, I found the token for, for the tornado. It's too much bad. Mervat Waba and Sammy Soriel lived on Moss Creek the night the tornado hit, killing 11 people who lived in three homes on this street. Seven of the dead were children, but for this couple, everybody survived. Yes. Everybody lived. Yes, Sunkis got. They left Moss Creek and will move into one of these new Habitat for Humanity homes miles away. And if a storm approaches now, everyone is scared. Me and Tudor. But what can I do? Much of Moss Creek has since been rebuilt. It's why Mohammed Finjan told me he stayed. Yeah, I got so much help. Uh, I got a new this car. Uh, and uh, give me some stuff and uh, clothes and uh, food and everything and give me uh, pay for me for a hotel. Fenjin has nothing but praise for how strangers helped along with government. Uh, when I got here, I, uh, I told God bless America and God bless government. Who built these homes? Was this uh, Louisville involved in this? Louisville, Habitat for Humanity of uh, Louisville, Metro Louisville sent their entire construction crew down here. 
Rodney Goodman leads Habitat for Humanity Bowling Green. Uh, a bathroom, and there'll be a washer and dryer in here. He's forever thankful to the enormous and quick support from the Louisville Habitat folks. Very excited. Sammy and Mervat are getting one built for them. Under the kitchen. We wondered how it's all being paid for. The couple will have some financial responsibility. They, they will get $40,000 in direct subsidy that helps them to buy down their mortgage. So this unit you're in right now is going to appraise. It, it already has appraised. We had it pre-appraised for about $150,000. And then there's the question of the next big storm. So where are folks going to dash in case another tornado comes over Bowling Green? Well, right here. Each one of the Habitat homes has been built with a crawl space. They'll have to come out of the house, around here, and right down into that basement. But for now, it's a busy time. The couple is expecting another child. Are things getting better? I hope so. <laughs> yes. And if you needed any hope for humanity, here's how Sammy responded when I asked him about his fellow Kentuckians. How nice have they been to you? Too much, too much nice. Too much is good, too much is uh, very, very, very nice. And they soon will be bringing home their new baby to their new Kentucky home. It's new life all around in the one year since the tornadoes. Our Reed Jaden and photojournalist John Humphreys headed right to Bowling Green within a couple of hours after the tornado had cleared. And he brought us some of the first images in the overnight hours of what had happened there. Now, one year later, they returned to those very same neighborhoods to find the progress being made and the lasting impact on this community. It was 1.17 a.m. when this EF3 tornado touched down in Bowling Green. City Manager Jeff Mazel got a call from Warren County's Emergency Management Director, Ronnie Pierce. And he said, Jeff, uh, just want to let you know that we have had uh, a major tornado, tornadoes come through and uh, we've got some severe damage. Videographer John Humphreys and I arrived in Bowling Green just behind the tornado. It quickly became apparent the damage was major and widespread. On the way in, we saw this semi flipped on I-65 near the exit. Another semi loaded with damaged Corvettes that had left the nearby plant where the cars are made. Fire Chief Jeff Brooks left the basement of his home heading to Central Dispatch. When it started to come in, you could you could tell by the severity and the type of calls, and and, and watch the map and watch our our crews kind of gather in, in this area. And it's it's uh, it's good to come back to this area because it brings back all of those feelings. And uh, when it all happened, it would be just a couple of hours getting to the station and getting over here to, to what we we knew as Ground Zero. I didn't know uh, the magnitude of it until I got to the police station and uh, I started seeing uh, the maps that they were already producing, the power, the power outage, how great it was. This was the scene all night in the Stonebridge area. It looked like a war zone. People injured, in shock. In a matter of seconds, homes and apartments were reduced to this rubble. A total of 17 people died. 500 homes and 100 businesses were destroyed. Hundreds of other homes and businesses were damaged. This is the Stonebridge Lane neighborhood. The area was hit very hard and devastated by the tornado's numerous fatalities. Behind me, you can still see a lot of the scars that are still there, but the scars are slowly fading. But it has taken the better part of a year to get to this point. Let's go vertical now with our Sky 11 drone and give you a look at this neighborhood, a comparison of what it looks like today compared to what it looked like the morning after the tornado. What nature did in a matter of minutes, it has taken nearly a year to get to this point. We met Angie Guathney at what remains of her home. She and her mom were sucked out of the basement by the tornado and thrown to the front yard. And she was one of the first to the hospital and she had to have like 70 something stitches. She's recovered. There were so many people that, that didn't survive, you know, which I still think about. Think about their families and, you know, people that, that loved them. Because there were whole families that, that literally died that night. We're still in recovery. We probably will be for another year. The recovery started the morning after the tornado. The view from the ground or the air 
shows the evidence of how a community came together to turn a very dark night into a shining example of caring and helping a neighbor. Families in rural Taylor County, Kentucky were hit hard when an EF3 tornado touched down in their community. One woman was killed and dozens of buildings and homes were destroyed. Now, one year later, First Alert Storm Team Meteorologist Alden German heads back to the area where they are rebuilding to find how things are going. We're a little small town Campbellsville. We had it here. We had the, the tornado here too, you know. Don't forget about us. Kelly and Anthony Parker lived in their Taylor County home for over 20 years when it was destroyed early December 11th, 2021. Their family lost almost everything. They had just finished paying off their home in February that year and have started over from almost nothing very slowly. Getting back on our feet's been, been tough. Even with the help of dozens of volunteers immediately after the tornado, it's been a challenge to get their property property rebuilt. Inflation and supply chain disruptions skyrocketed the price of building materials. Even at that, I mean, if you do get supplies, there's so many people, they're so busy, there's not enough workers, you know, to build all these homes back. The Parkers and many other families that are rebuilding their homes aren't taking any chances. Even though they have a basement, they elected to go ahead and install a storm shelter for extra protection just in case. The Parkers delayed building, waiting for prices to come down. Other families didn't, but almost all have taken on significant debt to get their lives back together. It's why Kelly Jones set up the Taylor County Disaster Recovery Group, which guides families toward resources and provides additional funds outside of insurance. Donations from national charities have been a great help, but it can be slow going through all the paperwork to find what qualifies for aid and what doesn't. That, that freedom of being able to do with that money what we need to is what we need. Rebuilding homes is the main goal of most charities, but not everyone in Taylor County lost their home. Instead, they lost barns and garages, a huge part of their livelihood. Direct monetary donations to local organizations like Taylor County Disaster Recovery help speed that process along. Any help has been appreciated, but it's been an exercise in patience for everyone affected. Fewer than 3,000 people called Dawson Springs home. It's also the home of the Kentucky governor's father, and Andy Bashir spent most of his childhood growing up there. When the tornado siren sounded on December 10th, it took less than 10 minutes to destroy 75% of the town and every single home in its path. Now, 12 months later, people are passionate about recovery. They're positive about the rebuilding process, and they tell us they are determined to stay in Dawson Springs, redefining what it really means to be home. A quaint downtown marks the heart of Dawson Springs. Signs of strength hang from businesses. The American flag flies proud above the square. In this small town of about 2,500, damaged homes stretch in every direction. Half a mile away, Dolores Williams meets us on her street. She's one of the hundreds who lost everything in the storm. Do you think Dawson Springs will ever be the same? I think Dawson Springs will definitely rally back. I think the last time we talked, I said that one day you'll have a pep in your step, and you'll smile again. And I can see that with a lot of folks here. Last time we talked, mounds of debris lined Clarkdale Court. It was February, two months after the tornado, and Dolores didn't have anywhere to live. It was about five months before I even found a place to live. And I truly believe if it wasn't for my cousin that helped me, because he worked for one of the complexes, I still would not have a place to call my own. Dolores had to move 25 miles away to Hopkinsville to find an apartment. Most of the affordable housing in Dawson, including her home, was destroyed on December 10th. Even though uh, I found an apartment with the, you know, with the help of my cousin, which I'm very truly grateful for, you know, it's just, you don't feel like you're at home. For Dolores, home is still here. I seen that and I thought, home, you know, I, I found something from my home. Um, Almost a year later, you're still finding pieces of your home here. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's amazing, really. I know it's probably meaningless, but to me, it's like, after all this time, you know, I find my flag. The flag, a reminder of so many things 
the home she lost, the holiday season, the tornado that took her neighbor's life. Now that December 5th is creeping upon us, I get, I, I get afraid. I, I can't help but get afraid. And um, I get stressed. And, you know, I think, please, God, don't let this happen again. Please don't. It was an EF4 tornado with wind speeds of up to 190 miles per hour, stretching more than a mile wide. It was so huge, it just twisted everything in a circle like a hula hoop, you know, around and around and around. Dolores remembers the sound. She remembers the fear. The rage of the tornado, it just takes what it wants. And whether, you know, you're left behind or it takes you. She survived, huddled in her bathroom. And that was like where our cars were parked. Miles away, so did LaDonna Hooper, seeking shelter in a neighbor's basement, emerging to find her own home had been hit and no longer had a roof. December 10th will always stick with us. She spent weeks with her family in a hotel before the school bus driver got a call from her superintendent, asking her to meet him at this shipping container near downtown. He was like, uh, welcome home. He said, temporary home until, until you can get yours taken care of. I just started crying because I'm like, okay, we're going to have some place that we can establish a home. Inside, she lives with her family of three and everything they own. When we come down the hallway, you know, one steps in the bathroom so the other one can get down the hallway. This is our bedroom. Of course, up front is where our daughter sleeps. It's not ideal, she says, but for now, it's home. Home to me is where you have your family and you have God in your home. To me, a home could be any anything, a storage container, a million dollar home, to a home is what you make a home. Home while they rebuild, not far from the shipping container. LaDonna showed us the new house. It's being built by hundreds of volunteers, some who just come in for a day or a few hours. They come into town to help families like hers. We've had so many people come in and just write verses um, on the walls and, you know, just kind of bless our home. This is our kitchen. This will be our kitchen over here, um, our living room. She says it's been a slow rebuild because they are relying on volunteers and donations. And even though it is taking time, she is so grateful. We can actually see a house. We can walk in it. It has doors. It has windows. It has, you know, uh, the power got hooked up to it. And I got to thinking, you know what? Life is amazing. You know, you're alive. You survived. You get up every morning and you put one foot down, put the other one in front of it, and you keep going. So, yeah, life is amazing. When she moves into her new house at the beginning of next year, another family will move into the shipping container as the community is still short hundreds of houses and most have not started to rebuild. But there is no lack of determination, not even from people like Dolores, still displaced, living in another town. I get excited when I think about a year from now, what can be here and what's gonna be here. And it's not gonna stay like this. Dawson is not gonna let it stay like this. The people aren't going to let it stay like this. A small community building back one home at a time. Dawson Springs is a very special place, and we stand Dawson strong all day long. The community also now getting help from the new Dawson Area Personal Services Food Bank. Various churches sponsor the bank, and it opened in a new location in October. The tornado outbreak changed the lives of thousands of people across Kentucky. For dozens, their lives were altered with the loss of a loved one. 80 people were killed across the state of Kentucky. Now, family and friends are doing what they can to keep their memories alive. For weeks, their photos hung right on a fence outside the badly damaged Graves County Courthouse, a reminder of those lost in the December tornado outbreak. These photos showing some of the youngest victims, like two-month-old Oakland Coon from Dawson Springs. 
I'm gonna miss her crying in the middle of the night, and waking me up. I'm gonna miss her, you know, not wanting to be put down, wanting her daddy and mommy to hold her. And three-year-old Jaleel Dunbar in Mayfield. He had so much energy, so much spunk. At the Mayfield Candle Factory, 13 people were killed, including Oldham County native Jill Monroe. Her co-workers telling her family she was trying to protect others when the huge storm hit. She said the last time I saw your mom, she ran into the last stall and took a bunch of people in there with her. And in Graves County, members of the Sheriff's Office doing their jobs in honor of Deputy Jailer Robert Daniel. A lot of our, uh, our jail uh, employees there at, at the jail have um, found ways to you know, keep his memory alive, whether it's uh, stickers or something like that. Small gestures to ensure his impact is never forgotten. And we will never forget. One thing we've learned one year later, we now all need to be prepared for storms that are bigger than we've ever seen. Even with all of the warnings of last year, this storm struck at night, the worst possible time, and it has made history. In Mayfield, Kentucky, that ends our special report from WHAS 11 News, Kentucky tornadoes one year later. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Doug Prophet. And I'm Shay McAllister. We wish all of Kentucky the peace of the holidays and a year of renewal.